Hi everyone, welcome to my virtual CNS poster. Um, in the next few minutes, what I want to do is try to tell you a new way of thinking about visual working memory and visual long-term memory that we've recently proposed, um, which I think has at least made me rethink what I thought I knew about visual memory, and I hope is uh, inspires you to do the same. To start, let's think about working memory. The standard working memory experiment looks something like this. You see some colors, they disappear, um, you're probed on one using a continuous color wheel, um, and you choose your uh, the color that you think it was. And in this task, errors near zero would be very good, so this distribution shows lots of errors near zero, so, um, and uh, also a very long, fat tail. Um, and lots of people have fit models to this, including mixture models, which are the most prevalent, um, that say that the long, fat tail actually comes from a uniform distribution of sort of guesses, um, and a central distribution comes from the remembered items, and they have some precision. And this way of thinking is extremely prevalent. There are hundreds of papers across many fields that make use of this idea that we can distinguish precision from number of represented items. Things like claiming a consciousness is discrete because guess rate changes, uh, the same claims in iconic memory, all over working memory, including relationships to intelligence, um, and uh, long-term memory, including some of my work, uh, claiming the same thing, that we can make these distinctions. And what I want to do today is tell you about an alternative conception of memory based on sort of a population code idea, based on noisy channels. Um, but actually it's a pretty cognitive model. It's actually really just signal detection and psychophysical scaling, psychophysical measurements. Um, we call this the target confusability, the psychophysics part, competition model, the signal detection part. And the model claims there's no such thing, no such distinction as how many things are remembered versus how precisely they're remembered. Here's what it looks like. Here's a basic 2AFC memory signal detection model. So in this model, uh, if you saw purple and then you uh, are tested on green versus purple, the way we think about this is that uh, your green memory strength is centered at zero. It didn't get any boost, so it's centered at zero, um, but it varies. Um, and your purple memory got a boost, in this case, two standard deviations, so d prime of two, so it has higher familiarity toward the right. Um, on individual trials, this means purple might sometimes feel very familiar and green less, or green might sometimes feel more familiar than purple, although that's unlikely given, you know, d prime of two, it doesn't happen that often. Um, but trial to trial, there's noise. That's basically what signal detection amounts to, noisy decision making. And the insight of the TCC model is just to consider what happens in a 4AFC test instead of this 2AFC test. And in particular, this 4AFC test reveals quite a lot, I think. Um, in this situation, you're now asked to choose which of these four colors you saw. Obviously, the purple color you saw still gets a familiarity boost. The green color still gets none. And the question is, what about those other two colors? So purple gets a boost because uh, its average familiarity gets a boost because it is the color you saw. Green gets none because it's far away. It's not very similar. But obviously a color one degree away from that purple color on the color wheel would also get a boost. People wouldn't even be able to tell them apart. So it must be the case that some colors nearby to purple also get familiarity boosts. And so that's the whole claim we're making, basically, which is that this dark green also probably gets no familiarity boost. It's very distinct from the purple. But this, um, and so it ends up with a distribution that looks like that. But this dark purple color um, gets must get some boost in familiarity, maybe quite a lot, because it's a lot very similar to the color you saw. And so that means in a signal detection framework, we should think about this dark purple color as having a boosted distribution. Um, and so on some trials, that dark purple color will be likely to win because it also has a familiarity boost. Um, I don't think there's anything controversial about this. It must be the case that people make more mistakes choosing dark purple than green in this kind of task. And so the only thing um, sort of left, if you want to generalize this idea, um, to continuous report to a test where you're asked to choose between all the colors is just to say um, what actual shape this function has. How does fam familiarity get boosted? Which colors get a boost when you see purple? And to, to measure that, all we do is just measure it. We just empirically measure this um, as a similarity function using psychophysics to get our index of familiarity spreading. Um, and in our hands, this looks like just a purely perceptual function. It's basically fixed across observers and conditions for a given stimulus space. It's a description of the color wheel, not so much a description of anything about memory. Um, and so this is not akin to precision or anything. This is just a, a measure of this color wheel. The way we measure this, sometimes we just use Likert similarity, um, but often we use this triad task. So if I ask about this purple color, um, 
it turns out people are pretty good at saying which of those bottom two colors is most similar to that top color, the right one. Those are 30 degrees apart and close to the target, um, but they're very bad at 30 degree differences across the color wheel. So which of those bottom two is most similar to that target is a very hard task. And that's true even though they're both 30 degree differences. So it must be the case that similarity is extremely nonlinear, that people's judgments are extremely nonlinear. Far away colors from a target are all very dissimilar and hard to tell apart. And in fact, when you fit a model to this psychophysical task, that's what you find. You find similarity near the target is very high, but it falls off very quickly, non-linearly quickly, so that um, so that the it falls off approximately according to an exponential. And this shouldn't be a surprise. This is just like discriminability in Fechner's law or Shepard's universal law of generalization or lots of work by Nasofsky. It's also consistent with neural population codes, right? Um, uh, purple shares almost no neural overlap in the neurons that code for it with either yellow or uh, green, even though it's closer to one than the other on the wheel. Um, and so the model just amounts to that. It just amounts to saying the exact same signal detection thing is going on as before, and familiarity boosts for colors are just based on this fixed function that we can measure. And so you end up with a, a plot that looks kind of crazy like this. Every color on the wheel has a familiarity distribution. Purple gets a boost of D prime 2, and all other colors get a boost that's just exactly related to their similarity to purple. Um, so the the distance uh, along the x-axis here um, for each color is just exactly its similarity here. And what that means is on a given trial, you might get a very strong purple signal, um, or you might get a weak purple signal and a strong green signal. The, the winner will be stochastic because that's how noise works in signal detection theory. And it turns out that if you vary d prime in this model, uh, it basically captures exactly what memory distributions look like. So at d prime uh, zero, they're all equally likely to win because no items have any boost at all. At d prime one, there's a long tail because all the dissimilar colors all get the exact same boost and so are all equally likely to win. Um, and by the time you get to something like d prime three, uh, only the colors that have gotten a big familiarity boost have a chance to win because the target got a huge boost. Um, and so only colors that got a big boost have a chance to outcompete it. Uh, the long tail doesn't exist anymore. Um, and our claim is basically just that all the data ever found using any continuous report task in this color circle um, looks just like this. There's only one parameter, just memory strength varies. There's not two parameters, there's not a mixture model, there's not three parameters, there's not variable precision. It just all looks like this. And that actually provides a really strong fit to data. So across set size, all you have to do is vary d prime to perfectly fit the distributions of the data, even better than mixture models fit them, even at the individual subject level. Across changes in delay and set size and encoding time and set size, all of these only seem to vary along this one parameter. Um, even though many models claim there are many ways memory can vary, uh, it, they always just one knob is all you need to fit the data. So this is strong evidence in favor of a one parameter model like this. It also works just as well in other stimulus spaces. Here's some sample orientation and face similarity data um, and the corresponding fits to memory. The poster concentrates on one study that really shows something strong, I think, about this model, which is that um, TCC lets us make predictions that should be impossible under previous theories. That's because all previous theories agree that this sort of fat tail, this uh, long fat tail on the edge here, um, is uh, caused by heterogeneity between items. That is, some items are contributing to this tail and others are contributing to the center of the distribution. Maybe these are unrepresented items or extremely low precision items. Um, but the claim is that the tail is fundamentally different than the center of the distribution. And this implies that if you just ask people to discriminate a maximally different to AFC task, just purple for screen, that that couldn't possibly measure all you need to know about memory, because it doesn't tell you anything about the more precise items. The only reason anyone ever makes a purple for screen error, a 180 degree error, is if they have an unrepresented item or a really low precision item. It tells you nothing about the precision of the high precision items. TCC, by contrast, makes a very strong prediction that once you've measured D prime, which you can do with with purple versus green, that tells you how much boost purple got, that all of the other possible things, like if you wanted to ask how well people would do if you gave them eight different choices of those eight colors, those are all completely predictable. That is, those are just based on the fixed similarity function. So we know exactly how similar each of those colors is to purple, and so we can predict exactly what the task people are doing is they're choosing the maximum of these eight, eight samples from these distributions or 360 distributions. And so we've tested this and it works perfectly. That is, if we just do a two AFC task where they are asked to do 180 degree difference, that's this top task here, then measuring D prime in that task, just norm inverse hits minus norm inverse first alarms, is totally sufficient to predict how well people will do in these other tasks, including continuous reports. So the blue line here is a zero free parameter prediction from this data alone and the similarity function. 
of continuous report and the gray is the real data and that you can see that across any number of different foils including continuous report this works just perfectly and it even works at the individual subject level so the d prime you measure in this task is exactly the same d prime that we measure in this task using the tcc similarity function model the last thing on the poster is to think about why it feels like you're guessing sometimes. I think one thing people find really intuitive is that at high set sizes, they just feel like they don't know a lot, and they feel like these resource-y continuous models can't account for that. Um, signal detection has this really nice property that um, s the strength of the signal in the signal detection, the familiarity signal, is confidence. That is, that is the strength of your memory. Um, there's no meta memory aspect of this. That's just how strong your memory feels to you. And so on this top trial, purple feels extremely familiar to you. And so you're very confident in purple is the answer. And here you're much less confident that green is the answer because you have much less familiarity in your winning signal. And so if we just ask at different D primes, say at set size one, three, and six in data simulated from TCC, how confident we'd expect people to be, what we find is that at set size one, they're always going to be really confident. Um, by the time they get to set size six, about half the time they're going to be so low confident that you might imagine they feel like they're just guessing. This is confidence that are consistent with zero memory um, with a d prime of zero can generate signals like this and so you'd predict something like a one percent twenty percent and sixty percent chance of feeling like you're guessing incidentally it turns out people have measured this with just a dichotomous confidence scale just are you guessing or not guessing um, like this paper from uh chris and adam um, and found almost exactly those same numbers so the subjective feeling of guessing is present in a signal detection model, but notably all of these are simulated from a model where every item is represented just exactly the same with the same deep prime. It's just that noise varies how strong your memory feels to you. Okay, so the model is that noisy decision making um, is the core of things. The memories differ only in strength. There's no separate concept of number of represented items in precision. The structure of the response distribution comes from noise plus a fixed stimulus similarity function. And Notably, this not only accounts for memory as a function of set size, encoding time, and delay, but allows generalization across tasks, like those two AFC tasks and stimulus spaces, accounts for ROCs, confidence reports, many measures of variable precision, long-term memory, and much more. Um, so I hope I've at least uh, made you interested in this. Um, for an intuitive explanation of the model, go there. Um, and to see the paper preprint, uh, you, can, you can go there. So thank you very much for your time, and have a good CNS.